just ask him that. All right, let me just run down here. I feel more comfortable. Please, humor me. <laughs> Okay, hello again and good morning once again to everyone. This is Caribnog Technical Forum. Live in St. Vincent and streaming on YouTube. W welcome to everyone who has taken the opportunity to come out and to be here again for this morning's meeting. And we wish to sincerely welcome our students. It's always good to see the young people. <laughs> Can you all just stand so we see the full, your full presence? I think there are a couple in the back who are registering. Are there some students in the back registering? Can you just come, let them come forward a minute so that we could just get a visual of them you take it another great you are you are our future and it just leads us into our keynote today which is securing the Car the caribbean digital future and so we are so happy, yes you can sit, please sit. We are so happy that you all are here this morning. We've, so I'll just give you an overview of the presentations today. We st I'm doing the welcome. Then we will be moving on to Beville Wooding, who needs no introduction, but I will tell you a little bit about him anyway. And we, have a, we take a break for a group photo because it's always important to, take, to have memories. We move on and you, those of you have, who have been here for the last couple of days, yesterday you would have heard the, uh, the ICANN presentation with Nicholas. And he is going to do another presentation for us this morning talking to us about DNSSEC. Then we have an update from our iOGS. Again, for those of you who were here on Monday, you would have heard me when I said that Caribnog partners with a number of organizations like um, ICANN, which we are doing at this meeting, like ISOC that we're doing at this meeting, ARIN, and a number of other organizations. So we will hear from a couple of them this morning. Then we hear from our software engineer, a local software engineer on the island. Um, she isn't local to St. Vincent, but she operates in St. Vincent. That is Christian, Kristen. And then we have a presentation from Trinidad and Tobago, and that is uh, Steve, and a short open mic session. So we hope to finish this morning by 12 o'clock. We'll have lunch, and then you'll be on your way, okay? So that's it for our That's it for our agenda. Again, it is so good to have all of you here this morning. So our keynote, as I said, Mr. Beville Wooding, before I do that, let me just, this is all important. How many of you, this is your first Caribnog meeting? First Caribnog meeting. Okay, great. At Caribnog, there is something that we say when you come to Caribnog. Once a Car I am Caribnog. Can you repeat after me? 
No, 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 no. Say it as if you had breakfast. I am Caribnog. Once again, I am Caribnog. Right. And that is because it is important for you to recognize that what happens here, you are part of it. And you continue to be part of it and you continue to help us to grow and develop within the region. And, and I started by that because Mr. Bevel Wooding has been, is the co founder one of the co-founders of Caribnog, which started in 2009. And his, he has a heart for the young people, and a lot of the work that he has done it, through his Bright Path organization has been to empower young people in the region. Bevel is the director of Caribbean Affairs for ARIN, which is the American Registry of Inter for Internet Numbers, a US-based nonprofit agency responsible for administration of internet number resources in the Caribbean. And so, but we also have another organization that's responsible for that, which is LATNIC. But Bevel belongs to Aaron. His work touches on many fields from technology and telecommunications to education, arts, and justice. He, is, or he was also, or no, he is also instrumental in the establishment of internet exchange points throughout the Caribbean, including here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In 2010, Mr. Wooding was designated by ICANN as a trusted community representative and entrusted as one of the seven recovery key shareholders. That means he, ha he held the keys to the internet. If you want to hear more about that, meet him on the break and ask him. Uh, he is our own Caribbean man who has been recognized internationally for his role in improving internet traffic, exchange, and supporting cybersecurity, building digital skills, and strengthening internet governance in the region. Let us please give Beryl a welcome round of applause as he comes and talks to you. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I was asked to address you on Caribnog. I know for many of you, it's the first time that you'd be at a Caribnog meeting. And for some of you, you may have heard about Caribnog, but not really fully understood what it's about. So what I will use this little talk to do is to give you a sense of what is Caribnog, why it exists, and how we, after having said we are Caribnog, how we actually form part of something even though we don't know we are a part of it. Is that okay? To understand why Caribnog exists, it is a Caribbean network operators group. Uh, on paper, it is supposed to be the group where technology enthusiasts, network engineers, cybersecurity experts, uh, computer scientists all get together to share information and knowledge uh, for the greater good. It's not unique. There are other NOGs or network operator groups around the world. There is NANOG, North American Operators Group. There is AFNOG, the African Operators Group. There is PACNOG, the, anybody want to guess? The Pacific Network Operators Group and so on. CARIBNOG started in around 2011. So it's also not, uh, it's not a new thing, but it's still relatively unknown. And part of why it's unknown and part of why, for much of the region, there still isn't an understanding of why NOGs matter has to do with the context that actually initiated CARIBNOG itself. Uh, some years ago, uh, myself and another current CARIBNOGger went to the North American Network Operators Group meeting. We thought we knew technology, we thought we were pretty good at um, computer engineering and the internet and so on. And we sat in this meeting for three days listening to people talk about router leaks and talk about assembly code that manages how Wi-Fi equipment gets created. And we looked at each other and said, but we, we, we're missing something in the region. We are supposed to be engineers. But when you think about what most Caribbean network engineers do, 
they maintain somebody else's system. They manage somebody else's equipment. And we looked at ourselves and said, but we need to get back to the point where our Caribbean engineers are engineers creating solutions to Caribbean problems. But for that to happen, we need to have the same level of excitement and enthusiasm around the thing behind the thing, not just how to get the latest and greatest model of a router or a server or some other piece of equipment set up, but how to build it. How does it work? Why does it work that way? What kind of mind created this solution that we now buy, rent, lease, manage, or maintain? And that was the beginnings of Caribnog. And we, we, we had to, to, to move from that shocking revelation inside of that Nanog meeting to the place that we are today, 10 years later. We had to ask ourselves some really hard questions about the Caribbean. Like, what about our landscape has stood as a barrier to us stepping into some of those more adventurous, creative dimensions of engineering and support? What about our landscape has made us the maintainers of somebody else's system as opposed to the creators of our solution? You're, you're following me? We have to ask those questions because we are from here. And inside of the answers, you look at a, a context in which every territory in the region is making more and more and more use of information and communication technologies. We, we have our mobile phones. We, launching our data centers, we rolling out our telecommunications networks. But increasingly, the understanding of how those systems actually operate and how they are built and how they are managed is something that we have to import. And that's not a good thing. Because when you follow the, the trajectory of that, you realize that the increasing dependence and reliance on technology that the region is having is not being followed or tracked by corresponding increase in knowledge and skill and understanding about how these systems are supposed to work. And there is a, a dearth, an absence of actual homegrown solutions to our computing needs. So that was the genesis of Caribnog, a recognition that in a region where we have small economies, small societies, um, a majority failure education system, um, constraints in terms of how we share and how we see each other, that there's this need to have an army of persons to support this growing and almost unstoppable digital tidal wave that's coming at us. And COVID really made that, the, the whole pandemic experience really brought that to the fore. Because at that point, when you couldn't as easily import support from other regions, a lot of businesses, governments, and institutions suffered for lack of local available expertise and resource. So I want to paint this picture to you so you understand what, what Caribnog, what's behind Caribnog. So we establish the network. It's entirely volunteer-based. It is not for profit as a vehicle, as a forum to share ideas, to share knowledge, and to share information and best practices. And we thought that would be a good thing, right? Who doesn't want to get free access to information and knowledge? And then we ran into another Caribbean reality, and that is the unwillingness or the reluctance to share. Yeah? Does that come as a surprise to anyone here? Yeah? We ran into that. So here we set up this, this wonderful, good-natured, Caribbean entity, and the tagline was, was really nice, networking for the greater good. Right, get it? Networking, computer networks, networking, human networks, for the greater good. And we hit the cultural reality that um, we, many of us, have been a culture to hold information. If you get knowledge, keep it because that's your power, your strength, that's your advantage, that's your leverage. But then we look at the internet, and we look at all of its great promise and its, its unprecedented development. And we realized the internet didn't grow like that. The, net, the internet grew out of sharing and collaboration. What became the World Wide Web and what we now enjoy as, as all of these wonderful tools and technologies came out of a culture in which knowledge was shared. And that continues to this day. That's what makes the internet grow and develop and sustain itself. 
But here we have this counterculture that says, well, if I am from company X, I can't share what I'm doing with company Y because that's my competitive advantage. Even in our academic institutions, we found that there was this reluctance to say what we are discovering and what we're learning. And I'm giving you all the, 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 the good, the bad, and the ugly of what Caribnog has to deal with because to understand why we exist, we have to understand where we exist. And we exist in that cultural context in which it is not necessarily reflective or easy to share knowledge. So we found ourselves having to do things different from Nanog and Afnog and Paknog, where in those environments they could dive straight into workshops that teach you about network routing, as we'll be doing today, cybersecurity, as we might be touching on later. Uh, we had to stop and deal with things like sharing is good. We had to deal with things like in the Caribbean, we actually have success stories. We had to deal with things like a local engineer, properly trained and with the mindset set right, is just as good as a foreign engineer. Those are some of the issues we had to deal with. Having our people stand up and boldly say, I did this on my network, and it's a good thing. And having their counterparts celebrate it. That's normal in, in, in many of the other nogs around the world. Here, that was a struggle because it didn't come with an accent. You get me? So when you have a brother saying, hey, I do this on my network, it sounds a little different from, I just did this on my network, and it's fantastic. Awesome, man. Right? It sounds different to the Caribbean ear. It has a different value weighting. And so part of what we had to do over time is to get our own engineers to value the voice and the insights and the expertise and the perspectives of their fellow engineers. Everybody following me? Uh, trying to keep it real for you. So, so when we say Caribnog and we say I am Caribnog, behind it is this, this acknowledgement that together, whether you are on the engineering side, on the software side, on the policy side, together we have the potential to change the trajectory of how this invisible but important part of our knowledge-based economy or digital economy, this important part works in a way that supports the ultimate goals. And that's what Caribnog has been effectively built around. So in the midst of the, the endeavors, we had to put a spotlight on who's doing what where. So in Caribnog agendas, and I think even today we're going to have a session called Lightning Presentations. That came out of a need to have people share in very short, informal ways what they were doing and just get comfortable standing up in front of their colleagues and peers and saying, I'm working on this. I'm thinking about this. I'm designing this. I just built this. I launched this. And having that, um, that showcase for all to see. But just having it showcased in a meeting is not enough. We also recognize that there's a need to use the media, um, the traditional media and social media, to also make it look good. Because if you turn any magazine related to technology open, you're not going to see faces like ours on the covers or in the center pages. And so we recognize that even the visual of what a network engineer is, or what they should sound like, or what they should be working on, is something that we have to do more work to put out. Everybody following me? Yeah? So, Caribnog is fundamentally a community. But like any community, it has to be built around specific philosophy. It has to be built around specific values. And it has to be built around a certain shared common objective. For Caribnog, the objective is this. Help, support, and facilitate the development and security and resilience of Caribbean internet and computer networks. That's our common mission. So anyone interested in that, the engineering of it, the support of it, the design of it, is a welcome member in the Caribnog community. Whether you wear badge A from company A, or you're out as a school student looking at a career in the area, the fact is the community has a space for you. It's a volunteer-based community, and it's a community that is founded upon some very specific values, which I've mentioned earlier, and I'll go over again today. Collaboration. That's key. It wouldn't work if there is an unwillingness to share. And we have this saying inside of Caribnog, what we know, 
we share and we share freely and openly. So you're going to find literal international computer experts sharing in Caribnog meetings about how the internet works, technologies that are, are coming on, screen, on, on the scene. They, their voices come from the Caribbean and from outside the Caribbean and they all openly share because of that collaboration value. Another value is creativity. We have been at various stages on the Caribnog journey working with governments, organizations in the private sector and non-profit non sector and civil society to ensure that they are appropriately considering how technology is deployed throughout the region as free advice. Why? Because without that advice, we can all find ourselves on the wrong side of a bad technology decision that literally impacts human lives. And we've seen that. We've seen that. I can, I can give examples of everything from governments that have deployed laptops in schools without securing them to giving laptops to homes that have no capacity to police them. And then one year, two years, three years later, you find you have vice problems, whether it is vice porn, vice gambling, vice just doom scrolling, right? Problems because it wasn't thought through with the appropriate voices in the room. It wasn't thought through with the appropriate technical training to go alongside the easy decision to purchase a thing. Everybody with me? Yeah? yeah? So, so that's where Caribna comes in in terms of how it provides advice. So those kinds of decisions could have the benefit of an expert regional-wide community that can say, you're thinking about this? Well, why not consider one, two, three, four? And that's what the, the Caribna community does in terms of its responsibility. What we know, we share. And, um, and another important very important value that undergirds the Caribbean community is the issue of caring. And some of these things sound nice, soft, and fuzzy, but they're really important to us because you couldn't do what we do if you didn't care. I remember talking to someone in, um, well, in the Caribbean, let's, let's put it that way, and he was asking, so you're doing these seminars, and you have these teams that come out and they do all this stuff, you'll get paid, right? I said, no. I said, no. I said, no. This is a volunteer-based community. You want to join us, right? And that's me asking him now. You're going to join us, right? He said, nah, Breds, nah. I didn't think I could give my time for that without some kankada, some money. And I was saying, you know, if you think about it, if you are in the IT industry and you have an increasingly wise and informed and aware clientele, you get more services. So you're thinking about the upfront, I want money to talk and share and exchange my information, but you're not thinking about the ignorance that blocks you from getting your next client. You, you understand? The greater good will be served, or, or another way we, we say it is, doing good is good business. Doing good is good business. So you can think about, I want to start a small business. I don't want to share what I know without somebody paying me, but they're not going to pay you if they don't know that you're an expert. They're not going to pay if you don't look like their notion of what a computer specialist is supposed to look like. What this stage does, and it's a regional stage, it allows different persons, whether they have a small business or a big business, whether they just came or they're here a long time, to stand up and share what they know in front of peers and colleagues so that people acknowledge that they have worth and value. You all with me? So what seems to be free comes with value. It might be upfront dollars, but it is upfront expansion of profile, upfront networking and partnerships, upfront creation of a sense of worth that allows people to go much further than if they try to do it by themselves. Which brings me to point number four. Even if you don't think there is a local audience for your interest, your business, your talent, your skill, tapping into the regional family helps everyone. Right? Because there mightn't be someone here in St. Vincent, for example, who is interested in somebody who is excited about router leaks. But there might be somebody in Trinidad and Tobago or Jamaica or Anguilla who is looking for just that kind of resource. How are they going to find you if you disappear into the unknown of a St. Vincent local context? Again, I will ask, everybody following me? 
And that's part of some of the traps sometimes of, of our islands. Uh, we, we, without the, the benefit of region-wide media and region-wide opportunities to move to and fro, we think about our problems and we think about our opportunities in a local context. When in fact, there are global channels to get out of the smallness of where we are. And that's a big part of what the Caribbean community has been designed to do. The sharing, seeing somebody or hearing someone from Belize um, doing a joint presentation with someone from Guyana about a problem that they solved in St. Vincent changes your concept of the Caribbean and what it means to be part of a Caribbean community. For us, there is a technical component of what we do, but the most important dimension of Caribbean actually is a human networking. The part that links me to you, that links you to the person sitting next to you, whether they're from your country or not from your country. Because in that dimension, we actually forge the, 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 the let's call it the, the, the ties that really make the work that we do meaningful. So we have something in, in Caribnog we call line time. And it is as important a part of the Caribnog meeting experience as the sessions talking about router links and cybersecurity and so on. And what is lime time? Literally, like the name says, it's a lime. Right? Some food, some drinks, some conversation, meeting people outside the context of their professional persona to understand who is that person and how can they help me and how can I help them do what they're doing. For the students here, part of what we're going to be doing in 2024 is actually taking the lime time formula down into the schools. Right? So not that you have to get Miss or Sir to give you permission to come to a workshop, but we actually plan an outing where you'll be mingling with professionals in the space for those interested in technology and asking questions in an informal setting so that you can get answers that you wouldn't ordinarily get in the classroom. Does that sound useful to our student participants? Is that something that might be a good value? <laughs> Students, that, I mean, if, this is how it works. If you don't like it, we don't do it. If it sounds like something you like, I need to get some sense of if this is something we should press on building out. What do you all think? Good idea? Useful to you? Relevant to what you want and think you need? Yeah? Okay. I'll take it that the, um, the voice of the few represents the voice of the many. Right? So by faith, I'm, I'm taking that as a yes. So clearly proceeding with the student lime time agenda. The other part of the, um, the Caribnog experience that I want to just share with you has to do with, so I spoke about the human networking. Uh, I spoke about collaboration. I spoke about the, the, the caring component, like we actually care about the development of the Caribbean. Part of how that care is expressed is in reaching out to other institutions because we recognize like so many things in the region, we can't do it alone. Caribnog has its mission, it has its value values, it has things that it is focusing on, but it needs to partner to get to that kind of internet scale capacity. And we do that with the organizations that you see on the banners around the room. So Caribnog counts as its partners the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, the IORG family. The IORG family essentially is ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ARIN, the American Registry for Internet Numbers, um, LACNIC, the Latin American Internet Registry, ISOC, the Internet Society, PCH or Packet Clearinghouse, a bunch of organizations that are also non-profit that also have as their mandate and mission this desire, this um, drive to support the development of the Internet at the local level. And so a big part of how we get this skill and find these international speakers and experts is through these partnerships. And you're going to see the benefit of that this morning when we have an expert talk to us about the domain name system. And I will leave the introduction to when that session gets going. Everybody tracking with me? So I'm describing Caribnog, I'm describing an organization that doesn't make the papers every day, but has been doing its work quietly, silently, and I would say effectively for the last decade. But what it has done is not enough to secure the future that stands in front of us. And what is that future? I think we're all tracking what's happening um, generally with artificial intelligence, right? How many have been playing around with AI tools? Anybody in the room here has been playing around with AI? Just, 
I know most of you know ChatGTP, but there are a raft of other tools. I'm looking at some voice cloning stuff um, for good reasons. Um, yeah, good reasons. Uh, there's some interesting stuff that, that uh, we're using in the justice sector to help with um, case management. And, and there are several areas where we recognize that if you look at the trajectory of some of these technologies, there's a very real potential for the gap between where we are in terms of Caribbean digital skill and capacity to be widened even further, even faster. And that is not a good thing. So we know that Caribnoc has to ramp up its, its, um, its support services. I, I see it like a, a tsunami. How many, some of you may remember uh, some years ago there was a tsunami in, the, in Asia, the far, far, far East Asia. And the images that came on the internet showed people walking to the beach when the water started to go out, which is like the worst thing to do, right? Because it's going out to come back in. But human beings, wonderful creatures we are. Um, you, you see this, this occurrence, this unusual occurrence, and you go to the danger, right? And the same thing is happening in the technology landscape. We're looking at artificial intelligence. We're looking at the move toward greater automation. We're looking at uh, increasing cloud services. And for most people, they're walking to it, not understanding that there's a backlash coming if we don't take certain precautions. So for everything that our governments or businesses push into the quote unquote cloud, we are taking dollars out of our local economy and then saying we don't have money. For every AI solution that we import, we are taking somebody else's data set with all of its inherent biases and then saying the technology not working for us. And the real approach that we believe needs to take place is we need to take a step back from where this tide is receding and figure out what does the Caribbean need to do in the face of these changes that are taking place. Are we putting in place the mechanisms to create Caribbean data sets for Caribbean built artificial intelligence tools? Are we creating the infrastructure, physical infrastructure for Caribbean data centers to support the growth in Caribbean data in our jurisdiction so that we are not unwisely and unwittingly exporting capital in a context and an economic climate that we cannot afford to. Those aren't technical decisions, but those are decisions that have to be informed by technical considerations. And we recognize that we increasingly need a larger group of persons who understand how to connect those technical considerations to the policy and leadership decision making that needs to take place. And that is the Caribnog of the future that I want to invite you to, to participate in. Right? Because amidst all of the things that we're seeing, one constant remains true, and that is there is value in investing in building local capacity. That is a constant. And that's what we are, we are about um, when we make this invitation to you all to say, I am Caribnog. Saying I'm Caribnog is not saying I'm part of an organization. It is saying I'm part of a movement that has been established to secure my future. That's what I am Caribnog means. It means that I can stand alongside organizations and experts and institutions that have a similar interest and desire in safeguarding my future, our future. Whether that future is localized or regionalized, it requires human beings who know how the thing go, right? Who understand how these systems work. So I hope this has been a useful overview of Caribnog as we get into this special one day edition of Caribnog. The real regional meeting starts in September in St. Kitts, September 14th and 15th, I believe, the Monday and Tuesday, second Monday and Tuesday in September. And I encourage you, whether you can go there physically or you can join online, to start checking out the Caribnog community. Right? Caribnog.org is the website. And we have opportunities for persons to indicate their areas of interest. And we're building out um, our systems for supporting a growing body of uh, Caribbean talent as we rise together to address these challenges. But I want us to think about, about this, this invitation that I'm making, not just as professionals or students or computer engineers or 
computer scientists. I want us to think about it as if we are together all architects of our future. Architects, the people who think about the design of how things must be set in place to take us forward. Because I actually believe we all have the capacity to do that. That is not a function of which degree you hold. That is a function of your sense of responsibility for taking responsibility for your and our future. How many of us think we could do that? Regardless of if you're in school, out of school, uh, whether you have a degree, no degree, just that capacity to think about what might it take to stay a course that is safe and secure and beneficial for us and our communities. How many, how many would be interested in, such, in joining such a movement? I'm putting my hand up first because that's what I'm committed to, right? I'm committed to. And if you don't put your hand up, no worries. We'll carry you there, right? We'll carry you there. It's not a right or wrong. But for those who put their hands up, there's a responsibility to take all these words to heart, to share knowledge, to put yourself in a position where um, that which you know you can offer to others to help raise the overall tide. There's a capacity inside of all of us to play a part in the future that we want and in the future that we deserve. So I hope this has been useful to you. This is the introduction to Caribnog. This is our special St. Vincent and the Grenadines Caribnog Technical Forum Day. But more than that, I hope it's your introduction to an opportunity to serve the region, serve your country, and serve your community. Thank you. Thank you, Bevel. Come, let's give Bevel a bigger round of applause. I was a little remiss at the start of this um, opening of this meeting. My name is Claire Craig, and I am the research director of Caribnog and the moderator of today's proceedings. So, but what you will notice is that we go in Caribnog, we address each other by first name. We're not into titles because we are all working on this together. It's a, it's a collaboration and a relationship that we are building. So I'm happy that Bevel you know, went into the details about Caribnog, how we started, and what is each and every one of us, what is our responsibilities. We have a couple of minutes, and so I would ask you, is there a mic, a roaming mic? Please um, let me see by the show of hands, are there any questions for Bevel? Or comments, questions or comments? Because I think what Bevel said was quite thought-provoking. And um, at least let me hear what you think about the whole idea of um, local solutions for global problems or even what he said about AI and the issues that, may be, that we may be embarking on. How do we treat with some of these things with Caribbean solutions? Any hands? Yes, there's a young man in a green shirt. Stand, state your name and your school and your, make and your question. My name is Isaiah Tony and I attend the St. Vincent Boys Grammar School. Um, since the beginning of Caribnog, has there been a decrease in dependence on international bodies um, like the US? A decrease, yes. Decrease? Yeah. So since the question is, since the establishment of Caribbean, has there been a decrease in the dependence on international bodies? I, I have no objective way of answering that, but anecdotally I would say no, because the decisions around technology at a regional level aren't always, as I, I, I just said at the conclusion, aren't always made by consulting the technical community. So. And there, there are some dynamics to how the Caribbean gets funding from international agencies um, that actually go sometimes even beyond the, the, the specific or peculiar Caribbean need. So there are agendas at the international level that have dollars associated with it that get foisted upon the region. And uh, where our governments need dollars, these things become very, very attractive. 
So the issue isn't always do we need the project or the development support. Um, there sometimes is unfortunately uh, a simple kind of economic, we need the money. We need the money. And, uh, and so it is increasingly important that the voice of organizations like Caribnog become louder and louder or more vocal advocates for a different dynamic in how we access development support and funds. That's one of the reasons why I was saying that the, the creation of, let's, let's call it this, a cadre or an army of professional indigenous talent becomes so important because the prevailing assumption is this, the region does not have what it takes to support what it needs. That's the prevailing assumption. One could argue whether it's true or not, but it is the prevailing assumption. So when persons come offering gifts in hollow horses, um, they look very attractive. But another noise has to be made if you want to create some counterposition to that. I see a hand in the, in the back. Oh, Thanks for that question. There's just, we'll take one more question, and then we stop for the break. Good morning, morning. I'm Nadine Hull. I'm from the NTR. We're not hearing you. Put the yes. Good morning. My name is Nadine Hull. I work at the NTRC. Um, but Bevel, I'm not sure if you were here on Wednesday, but you were here on Wednesday. Online, online, online. Oh, no, okay. No, I was just wondering how does the the skills training or our need mm -hmm. in the Caribbean how would it dovetail or how would it fit into the, our local movement? Mm -hmm. With regard to the CAD, the TP, the Digital Transformation Project, if there is any overlap, I was just wondering. Right. So uh, for those who, who may not be aware, the World Bank and the OECS um, have entered into a digital skill transformation project. Um, they are in the process of defining different streams for it. Uh, there, again, a lot of dollars uh, have, have been allocated for it. And it, it at one level, acknowledges that there is need to create different sets of digital skills or skills to support the digital economy. At another level, that project um, is not concerning itself um, very strongly with the, the connections in the ecosystem. Uh, and, and this is one of the, the, the unfortunate disadvantages of siloed approaches to problem solving. So what I discussed with you earlier essentially outlines the, the, the reality that if you think about the, the digital economy, you can't think about it only in technical terms. If you think about digital skill building, you can't think about it only in terms of workshops and seminars. Uh, you actually have to have a fundamental rethink of the education system. That's a harder pill to swallow for a development agency because it requires a much more structured and systemic approach to rethinking education. Um, and so what, what you see in cases like this is that project will have value in one area, but there still needs to be other things happening from within the region, not defined by a project, but defined by a more comprehensive approach to what development ought to require. And, and that needs, and I, I, I hate to say it this way, but it's a reality, that needs a different conversation. Not more talk, a different conversation about our willingness to really invest in truly transformational change. And, and that conversation to this point has not yet happened as, as deeply or profoundly as it needs to. And that's why I'm saying whether it's through Caribnog, through ARIN, through ICANN, through ISOC, through NTRC, through the government, through CARICOM, or through whomever, the point is a different dialogue needs to be initiated. And we need to push for that dialogue. Anyone who sees the, the, the dangers ahead um, needs to also feel this sense of responsibility that something different has to be done in terms of how we're approaching the development um, track. Yeah? Does that? Yeah, OK. Rudy? While, while we take Rudy's question, we're going to have a group photo, so just I would like our photographer or photographers to prepare uh, for taking that photo so we can get the time back. Uh, Bevel, thank you. Uh, we go back a little way. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wanted to make just a clarification. Mm -hmm. um, in the Carib Nog community, everyone works for someone. Mm 
-hmm. you know, they might work for the government, might work for the bank, might work for the, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the relationship between what the members, who the members work for, and what is their relationship with when they are in the Caribbean community? Who are they? You know, you know, oh, that's, that's, yeah. a very, that's a very interesting question. Okay, because, uh, but it, uh -huh. yeah, it is. Uh, but also, um, I'm just wondering whether or not we've got to the stage at Carib Nog where we are having l um, regional, local fellows. Mm. Not quite yet, but right. that's, so the pandemic interrupted. Okay. Uh, let me deal yeah. with that, that last part first. It's the easier part to deal with. Uh, the, the pandemic interrupted our plans to move toward uh, a more evolved structure for Caribnog with different teams and, and um, action groups and working groups and advisory groups and whatnot. We're going to get back to that in 2024 now that we are starting to see a uh, small light at the end of the intra-regional travel tunnel because um, that, that's a big impediment to building out and, and, and um, really strengthening the Caribnog community. The first question Rudy asked was, so what badge do you wear in Caribnog? And I, I remember from those early meetings to now, the issue is when you're inside of the Caribnog space, you wear the Caribnog badge. Um, we have persons from some of the fiercest competitors in the region. Let's take our telecom sector. A Digicel sitting now next to a cable and wireless talking about network security design. Because in this context, that design, the, the way that the discussion is going is not a trade secret issue. It's a we all need our networks secured to protect our customers. In a Caribbean context, we, we, we talk about pairing or, or having uh, conversations that deal with um, traffic exchange for internet services where providers who again are competing for customers agree to collaborate to support the, the delivery of local content over internet exchange points. Those are Caribbean discussions. A lot of what I said, it nine years ago would have been theory we were talking about we need to move toward this place today it is lived practice and experience and i could safely say it works it works we have some some veteran carib in the room if they want to they can confirm or deny these reports uh, but i want to tell you sharing knowledge exchange sharing ideas and experiences helps us all to be better at what we do and we, we take it for granted when we do a Google search that we'll find an answer. Or now for those using ChatGTP, when you do a ChatGTP inquiry or request that you'll get an answer. Think about it this way. Somebody put that answer there for you. And a lot of people don't think about it from that standpoint. When you do a search and you get a result that is the answer to your question, some human being decided to freely share what they knew with you. And all we're saying is that for the region to get to the next level of its development and advance, we need to start doing more of that for ourselves, right? And remove this facade of, of competition when, in fact, we're all part of the same Caribbean family. So in Caribnog, short answer, no badges except the Caribnog badge. Together, we have one mission. Make our networks better, stronger, more secure, and more resilient, right? That's a Caribnog glue or adhesive that binds us. I think we had one more question behind Albert. No. No? Okay. The guy right here. Okay. No, right next to Albert. Yo, yeah, okay. Look, look, use, it. use my mic, please. So my name is Denroy Mactier. I represent the St. Vincent Cooperative Bank. Um, I'm piggybacking off of the question that Rudy's question. He asked about badges and professionals at work in Caribnog. Now, I represent the, if you don't mind me, I sit in. <laughs> I represent the financial sector, and we, our concern is about data sovereignty. And you mentioned local data centers in the Caribbean when you were doing your speech. My question is, are there any frameworks or push towards regional data centers from the Caribnog side? Let me take this one too, and I'll just answer both at the same time. Thank you. My name is Foster Burke. I'm from Pembroke. I run a small guest house. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned in your presentation about the government's attempt to uh, enlighten schools and students who go there uh, by 
handing out uh, laptops. And uh, you also indicated that it was a program that wasn't well thought about because uh, the results, or some of the results that came out of that were not very helpful. Uh, it probably wasn't in intended. I'm just like, I would just like to know where, where Carib Nog stands in terms of either advising government on how to do these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Is there some cooperation between you and government in that regard? Yeah. All right. So I'll deal with both questions. Thank you for the question. Uh, with regard to the data centers, uh, inside of the Caribbean community, there are data center operators. Um, I can think of a few in the Dutch Caribbean uh, who have all set up what they call regional data centers because they're outside of the hurricane belt in the case of Curacao or because they have access to large pipes from Europe and North America in the case of St. Martin, for example. And then you have other data centers being built in Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago because the economy can support the five nines um, type structures. What we have been doing as a Caribbean community is in having those, those stakeholders share about what their data centers can and can't do, is we're creating a context for people to understand. If you are concerned about data sovereignty, and for those who don't know, data sovereignty effectively um, speaks to the requirement or the responsibility to keep local data inside of local jurisdictions, or at least in friendly jurisdictions where you're not likely to have uh, your data, your information, or your intellectual property compromised. Um, so there is a big push across the region to have data security, data sovereignty laws passed and, and stipulations put upon operators to keep local traffic within local jurisdictions. So in terms of a regional data center, that can only be a marketing tool until persons from across the region decide to situate their, 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 um, their servers and services there. So we have the marketing part of it. There are several um, data centers across the region that tout themselves as being regional data centers, which effectively means not in North America or not in Europe, but in terms of actually being home to Caribbean or region-wide um, data services, they're not quite there yet in many cases. Um, the closest, I think, to that would be the, um, the data center in Curacao, right? Because it has, it has acted for a number of years now as the backup place of choice for, um, for persons who want to get outside of the hurricane belt. Um, but in terms of that general movement, a, a data center operator can only market it as regional until regional um, customers decide that they're going to situate themselves there. The other thing that, that prevents the data center, um, the regional data center concept from growing is the cost. Um, the economies of scale in the region. It is still more economically attractive. I'm not saying economically beneficial, but more economically attractive to go north, or in the case of some of the other Caribbean territories, to go Europe. All right, so that is where I, I believe the, um, the laws, the policies need to meet a different thinking about the need to invest in infrastructure. Uh, this is not the place for it, but I'll quickly say this. When we host or house our data in these external environments, we are effectively subsidizing their economies. Like if you track the dollars, the economics of it. You think about going to Miami to service your rack inside of Napa the Americas, hotel, airfare, uh, taxi, meals. So the, the, the thought that we can't do these things in the Caribbean is not a simple one-off cost. It's, it's like if you build it, and you make it attractive over time, like the university, like the hospitals, like the medical schools, over time it will create an ecosystem that is beneficial to the local economy. So if you're only doing the math on how much does it cost me to save this data out there versus over here as a short-term thing, uh, you'll always come up with the wrong answer in terms of what is beneficial for the local economy. Yeah, but as a finance guy, you should understand what I'm saying. Um, and, th and that's where, again, the advice um, that is offered is not just technical, but it is, is national development, economic development oriented. And that's the voices that we want inside the Caribbean community. Second question had to do with the, um, with the students and they, they, do we advise um, governments on those kinds of decisions about deploying devices? The short answer is yes. Uh, the Caribbean community is tied at the hip to the 
Caribbean Telecommunications Union Conference of Ministers of ICT, or Ministers with Responsibility for ICT. Do we always have the right conversations with them? No, we could only go when invited and only say what we ask to say. Um, but we do use the corridor opportunities to, to make it clear that what we are seeing on the network points a very disturbing Caribbean trend in terms of usage patterns and so on. Um, again, assumptions. The assumption is if you give a school child a laptop, they'll use it to do homework. And if I come across on this side of the room where most of school children are, you'll be like, <laughs> yeah, right. right. It's an access device to an open internet. And, and there are still policymakers who think that if you, it's sufficient to give them a device and they will always go um, down the street and narrow road in terms of what they use it for. And that just does not apply. And so increasingly, steps have to be taken to safeguard the youth um, by putting other policies around the issuance of devices. So we're working with the CTU on that, but it's a, it's a long journey to get to where we need to get to. Um, that will be it for questions, moderator. All right, so that's the end of our first session. I hope it was useful. Was it useful? Yeah? All right. Thank you. So what, what we're going to do now is very quickly take a group photo and then go to break. Uh, so could the camera person or persons direct us as to how best we can do this? Do you want us in the crowd and you take one shot from, from there, or do you want people to... What, what's the best thing for you? So we could just sit down in the aisle... And you can grab the whole picture. Yeah, don't do that. All right, give, give us instructions. Take a leg stand. Come in the center, please. Um, this is not over here, so like, balance. A little bit, a little bit more. No, 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 a little bit more. Can I ask for help? Um, if you could ease a little bit more to the end, because like how she is, so you know, good, good. Too far, right. Yeah. Three, two, one. Three, two, one.
Okay, for those who need a, a bio break, I encourage you to run out now. We're going to move straight into our next session. And I'm going to hand back over to our moderator, Claire, to take us to that session. Nicole, you're ready.
So everybody, I hope everybody got at least a coffee and some food. You can bring it in and sit with your with your coffee and food here. Um, okay. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Okay. Uh, please raise your hands, those of you that are uh, related or studying something related with IT, with information technologies, like or some of you that would like to study something related to IT. So the, one, one comment. The, the, when, when someone says, raise your hand, if you do this, it's like, mm, I'm in doubt. So it's like this. OK, great. That's, that's raising your hand. OK, thanks. Um, what we are going to do is I'm going to change a little bit uh, the, the about the presentation, I'm gonna do a fast, uh, a few comments at first about what's a network and how it works. And then um, I'm gonna go very fast through uh, what's the DNS. We've, we've gone through that yesterday, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a very, very fast recap on that. What's the DNS and then some of the, of the things that are actually in the presentation, which is other stuff that was developed after the DNS was created that adds functionalities to the DNS, okay? They, they, it, they, these things we call protocols add to the original DNS protocol things like security, privacy, resiliency, etc. okay? But first things first. What's a network? Any of you know what? Raise your hand. Those of you that know or think that know what a network is. Ah, come on. OK. You know what a network is. Maybe you don't know how to explain it, but you know what a network is. You use networks every day, hundreds times a day, probably. OK. We have these devices that are not are no longer phones. Right? We still call it phones, but that's not. This is not a phone. This is a computer. It can also be used to call someone, but that's the 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 less usage we give to this to this device, right? We never call. We just text someone or you know navigate through web pages, do stuff with applications, play with that, anything but calling. <laughs> so we we should change the name. <laughs> we should we should stop calling it a phone. It's not longer a phone. Phones are things of stuff of the past. Yeah, okay. So ac actually, it's more <laughs> this, this thing. Some of these things are far far more powerful than any computer we have ten years ago. Any computer, okay. So what's a network? A network. A, a simple definition of a network is maybe two or more two or more devices interconnected in order to exchange any kind of data, right? So you have two devices or more, could be 1,000, could be thousands of millions of devices connected, interconnected to exchange data. So what's the network? The network is the thing that allows for the interconnection. So it's the thing that we have between the devices that make the devices or make possible for the devices to interconnect and exchange that data. And uh, around 1984, if I'm not wrong, there's a, an international standard organization called, let me translate this to English because I, I'm used to the Spanish <laughs> acronyms. Uh, so this is ISO. So it's International Standard Organization. It's an organization that it's probably the biggest standardizing organization in the world. They do standards of almost everything, even things that has nothing to do with each other. They do standards on how to build uh, flats, houses, how to build uh, electronic devices, how to build cars, how to build safety systems how to build extinguishers, <laughs> anything. And uh, in the year of 1984, they released a standard on networks. 
So it's a, uh, a standard that tells developers, students, and people that operate networks, people that design networks, how to think about networks. And the basic, the basic idea behind that, that uh, standard is the old saying, divide and conquer. So they took the whole network problem and divided it into pieces, small pieces. If you solve all those pieces, you have a network. Okay? And they call it that model, it's a conceptual model, uh, they call it that model OSI. Open System Interconnection. Okay? Funny enough, the thing that it's open is not the system, but the model. The, op the, the open in the Open System Interconnection name of the model is that the model is open. It can be adapted to any network. Any network. This was created 40 years uh, ago, and it's still the model that we use for studying networks, for developing networks, for operating networks, everything, okay? And as I say, it divides the network into small pieces. So, uh, some of those, uh, all of those pieces are piled together, down to top, and at the most uh, below of the model, we have like what we call the physical layer. That's that's the cables, the most of the hardware that make possible to interconnect things. Okay, fiber optics, Ethernet cables, uh, all the wiring. Even if you are using a wireless network, that is also at the physical layer at some point. Okay, even even if you cannot touch because it's wireless, it's the 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 thing that enables. The, the interconnection of the devices, okay? So that's what is called the physical layer. And then on top of that, there are many, many layers. Somewhere in the middle of all, all of that, there's a layer that is called the network layer. So it's not a very happy name because the whole model is of a network, but one of the layers, it's also called the network layer, okay? And that layer, one of the main tasks that lives within that layer is what we call routing. And we are, we, I think we are having a routing one-on-one routing -on -one session later today. What is routing? Routing, without trying to spoil the presentation, <laughs> routing is the, the, the act of taking the data from one device, deciding which path that data should follow in order to reach another device. So as I, as I was telling yesterday, it's like the GPS mapping system of the network. So you give the data to the network, all of the devices that live at that layer three level, they will decide which is the, the path, the highways that the data is going to follow from one device to another device, okay? Normally you have many, many, more than one way or more than one path from one device to the other, so you have to decide which one are you going to, to take with any with some criteria like speed, security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, that's the, the one of the main tasks at the network layer. And then at the top of the model, we have what we call the application layer. The application layer is the one that we normally know about most. That is where all the things that we normally call applications, all that the things we interact with, live. So the browser, the chat programs, the mm, file browsers to access files that live in the cloud or whatever, all of the applications live at that layer, at the top of it. So we have at the bottom the physical layer, somewhere in the middle the network layer, and at the top of everything the application layer. Okay, enough for network recap. So, and we are going to get to the DNS in a few minutes. Um, in order for making things easier for people, the ones that designed this uh, huge network that we call internet 
thought of a way of using names in instead of numbers. Why? Because you know each device that you connect to a network needs to have an identifier. And that identifier has to be unique. Because if you have two devices with the same identifier, then you don't know which are you going to talk to. Okay, it's like the name and surname of each of you. If some of us have the same name and surname, mm, it's gonna be difficult for us to call each other, okay? It happens with names. It does not happen with, mm, it does not happen with IPs. Okay, that's a small lie, but I, I'm gonna tell you why later. Um, so each device has a unique identifier, a number. We call, it, we, we call those identifiers IP numbers. You have IPv4, you have IPv6, two flavors, same purpose. Identify a device, okay? The same way that um, the telephony directory, it's okay, call it telephony directory, thanks Albert. The telephony directory works for telephony. Why we have a telephony directory? Because it's easier for the human brain to remember names than numbers. Well, in the internet, the same happens. It's gonna be easier. Someone said, oh, it's easier for us to remember names instead of remembering the IP of each device I want to connect to. Each time I want to connect to google.com, I have to type the google.com IP, but I don't know what's the google.com IP. I just go to google.com and some magic happens there that that turns into an IP and then I, I'm, I'm showed the, the, I see the, the, the web page in this case, okay? So that magic, that is not magic, of course, it's called the DNS. The DNS is the telephony directory of the internet. The DNS is the one in charge of taking the name and giving back the number, okay? So I tell the DNS system, I want to know the IP for www.google.com. I'm, I'm, this is kind of sponsoring Google, but okay, let's change. Let's use www.nicolas.com, okay? And because we want to access my page. I, I don't have that domain, but anyway, suppose I have it. So you type www.nicolas.com. The first thing that will happen is that your browser is going to do a query, a send a query to the DNS system asking what's the IP of www.nicolas.com. The DNS will answer you with the IP and then the browser will connect to that server and display the page, the web page, okay? So we've come to the DNS, okay? Now we know what the DNS is and what's the reason behind that. The reason is as simple as it's easier to remember names than numbers. So by the way, if the DNS stops working, internet won't stop working. Internet will still be work, but the thing is that it's gonna be useless because no one remember the numbers. And if you don't have a way to translate, you're lost. It's like the same thing if I delete the telephony directory from your phone. <laughs> you just won't be able to call anyone because you don't remember all the phones of your contacts, okay? This is the same. So it's a critical uh, service in the internet. And by the way, remember we talk about the, the layer model, DNS, it's an application. From the technical point of view, DNS is an application, okay? It lives in the top layer of the model. Okay, now we go to, to this. Before going to this, let's very fast uh, mention how DNS works. So DNS works this way. DNS is really a huge database with names and the corresponding IP. Those, that database has a, a a, part, a particular thing that it's that it's not centralized. It's a distributed database. So not all the data is in the same place. The data is spread all over the world in thousands of hundreds of servers that have a piece of the whole database. So in order for you to find the answer for your query, you will first need to find the server that has that information. And once you find the server that has that information, you have to ask that server, okay, now tell me the IP for this name, and that server will send you the IP for that name, and that's the end of your query, okay? There are two types of servers in the DNS system. One, that is called authoritative server. 
Okay, that's the one that holds the information. The, all of the authoritative servers together are the ones that build the DNS database. So, in in other terms, DNS database it's the whole, all of the authoritative servers together. Okay, and then there is another server that we call Resolver. The Resolver is the one in charge of resolving queries. So. In order for the user not having to look for the answer for themselves, so if you look at your phone directory, each time you want to call someone, you are the one that is going to search through the directory, find the name, and then call it, right? In the DNS, it doesn't work like that. In the DNS, you as a user just tell one resolver, there are also hundreds of thousands of resolvers out there, you choose just one, all of them do the same task. You, so you choose one and send that resolver the query. Oh, I want to know the IP for this name. The resolver will find the authoritative server that has that information, will get that information, and once it has it, will give it back to you. But you don't have to do anything. You just send the query to the resolver and wait for the answer. Okay? That's how the DNS works. The original uh, specification of the of the of the DNS does not allow for um, security, privacy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there were a, a lot of protocols that were added to the DNS in order to provide to add to the original standard security, privacy, etc. So I'm going to do a one minute or two very fast recap on this, um, and. One of the one of the things that that you can you can this is this is a um, a very nice for me it's a very nice uh, graphic that shows the whole this is all the DNS all the DNS ecosystem okay this is all the this is this here that says stub is the user represents the user computer telephone fridge light bulb anything that it's connected to the internet okay game console anything that is connected to the internet. Um, there are some st very strange things connected to the internet today. For example, uh, a microwave. I don't know why you have to connect a microwave to the internet, but it's interesting. Um, recursive servers, the one in charge of searching for the information in the DNS. The authoritative servers, the one that are actually the, the DNS database. Th these are the ones that, as we said, had the information for the DNS. And then other other participants in the ecosystem that we are not going to, to, to get into detail today, okay? So each of these relations between DNS components can be the target of an attack, can be a point of failure, okay? So there were protocols that were developed in order to give or add security, privacy, resiliency, etc., to those to those uh, in those relationship between the different components of the DNS. Some of them, we are going to go very fast through one of those that is called DNSSEC. DNSSEC lives here. It adds security to this exchange of data, to the dialogue between recursive server and authoritative servers. So each time in the original protocol, the recursive server searches for the authoritative server that has the information by sending the query, the query, the original query the user sent to the resolver, the resolver will resend it to each of the uh, authoritative servers in the search of the of the answer. And the query is gonna be sent in this, what we call plain text. So everyone in the middle can see what's going on. The problem is that you can do a, an attack and change the authoritative server. Pretend to be the authoritative server that you are not. And the resolver won't have any way to know that you are a false authoritative server. So someone, long time ago, created this protocol called DNSSEC that what, what, it, what, what it adds is the ability for the recursive server to make sure that it's talking to the original authoritative server. How it does that? All the information that the authoritative server sends back, all the responses that the authoritative server sends back to the resolver are digitally signed. So we use digital 
signatures in order to prove the authenticity of the data. And the resolver will check, will first check the signature. We say, okay, is this signature original? And it has a means to do that. If the signature is the original one, it's a real one, it will give the answer back to the user. If the signature is false, the recursive server will give an error message to the, to the user because something is wrong with that answer. That's not the real answer, okay? It could be that the authoritative server is under attack. It could be that it's actually a false authoritative server, etc. So it's basically checking digital signatures. And if everything is okay, I send you back the answer. If something is wrong, I, there's an error. I'm not giving you the answer because it's false and you can fall into a trap, okay? There are other, other protocols. You may have heard of DOH and DOT. Those live here between the user and the recursive in a different uh, exchange of information compared to the NSEC. And those add security. Those are privacy, add privacy. The, what either of them, DOH or DOT, add is they create a secure channel, an encrypted channel between the user and the recursive. So all the information, all the dialogue between the recursive and the user, it's encrypted. So no one in the middle, no matter if it's able to capture the data, will be able to see what's going on because it's encrypted. And the only one that have the password for decrypting that are the user and the resolver. No one in the middle will be able to see what's going on. It's like a VPN you're creating between those two servers, okay? And there are other, other protocols that add other, other uh, capabilities to the DNS ecosystem. What I want you to keep in mind is as we go, as we said, how, what's a network, how it works, what's the importance of the DNS, where it lives in all the network structure, and that the original DNS has evolved by adding to it a lot of uh, protocols that make things more secure, more private, and more resilient, okay? Thanks very much. This has been a lighting presentation. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. Thank you, Nico. I will just allow one question for Nico because we already have our um, online presenters online. Is there a question for Nico? I guess you all understand clearly about DNS or you don't understand anything at all. <laughs> one question from a student here. Okay, good morning. My name is Brad Alexander. I'm here representing with NTRC. Um, well, I did study information technology in school, and uh, I remember the term DNS attack. But really and truly, how is the DNS being attacked? That's my concern. Oof. Do, do we have like three more days? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent question. We have a, a whole bunch of, of, of capacity building uh, courses, let's say, to answer that, we are very happy to uh, write, doing maybe engage with them and, and do a virtual presentation or, or something for you, but there are many, w the ways of attacking the DNS, you are asking, the ways of attacking the DNS are so many. There are many, many ways for attacking the DNS. Those are the means you use to attack the DNS are in the, in the technical language are called attack vectors. So attack vectors to the DNS, there are many of them. Each of them target a different part of the DNS ecosystem that we showed there, okay? So there are so-called attack that is called man in the middle, which is standing in the middle of a communication in order to get the data and try to modify it before it reaches the, 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 the end user in order to make the end user fall into a trap by changing the IP. For example, if I change the IP of the answer of the DNS, you are targeting a different server, but you may think that the server is the original one because you have no means to know that that's a different server, for example. And if I build a web page in that server that looks exactly the way that your bank web page looks, you're gonna type your username and your password for your bank account, and guess what? I'm gonna get your username and password, and then I'm gonna empty your bank account. So there are that, that's one simple and pretty much solved kind of attack. DNSX solved most of that, most of that issue. Um, but there are many, many others that we, we need like a l at least a day to talk all about, about all the basic 
attack vectors and how they work and how to prevent to prevent that. But these protocols I mentioned here are some of those protocols that you should deploy if you're running a DNS server or, a, or, or, or uh, whether you are running an authoritative server or a recursive server, protocols that you should deploy in order to add security, resiliency, or privacy to the DNS in order to try to avoid falling into those attacks. Or at least if it's not possible to avoid the attack, because there are some attacks like the, the denied of service or distribute denied of service, those attacks cannot be avoided. You, ha you don't have a means to avoid that attack. You just have to support it. There are protocols that you can deploy in order for lessen the impact of those attacks. Okay. Thank you, Nico, and thank you for that question. Um, sorry, we can't take any other questions right now. We're running, really trying to keep on schedule. But Nico is here. He has to leave this morning. So I hope you could just take a sidebar and ask him any questions that you have. We need to just reboot for one second, and then we bring uh, one minute, and then we bring our online uh, presenter on. Okay, I think we're ready to go. and holds a private pilot license and he enjoys classical guitar music so you see he's not just a techie he's well-rounded so let's give Shannon a round of applause to give us an update on what is happening uh, at the um, internet society thank you Shannon you can start just unmute your mic Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm yes, we can hear you. I can you see my thumbs up? Yes. I'll, I'll send you a WhatsApp.
we need good work with our local chapter. So if there's some galleries, we do have a chapter that of that. The last five drop stamp done. So if it, if you're not part of your chapter, I would like to invite you to contact with Sam John and have a meeting with part of that chapter as well. We do have some giveaway numbers, so people all around the globe, you can join in and have a five year class and see part of what the college is doing for Nama. If you belong to a given organization, you can also become one of the organization members of the International College. And if you would, and if you would like to say what I'm going to add,
Thanks again, Shannon, for that presentation. We need to move quickly into the next update, which is from Latnic. Remember we said that there are two internet registry organizations in the Caribbean. Aaron is one, and Latin is Latnic is the other one. And this presentation will be made by Alejandro Acosta, who is the R&D coordinator for Latnic and a member of different internet organizations. He has three specialists in the area of technology from the University of Michigan and Maryland. He was previously chair of the, of the LAC TF, which is IPv6 and the task force. And the, he was IT and support manager for British Telecom. And so we look forward to hearing this short update from Alejandro. Thank you, Alejandro. Please go ahead.
how many servers in the world they have IPv6, uh, sorry, I, I, I'm receiving, I, I thought that maybe it was my, my mic, but it is not. Do you hear me? Hello, Claire, everybody. Unfortunately, I'm receiving a full feedback of my own voice. Are you hearing me, Alejandro? Sorry. Wow, but there is some happening because when I talk, I listen to myself. No, yes, we are hearing you. We are hearing you. I know you are here. There is an additional feedback. Oh. of the prep they, they they are there's a very good number not found already about 53 percent which is not that bad okay we are looking to have more greener, more green of this over this yellow and this is not good for the invalid why invalid is bad okay it makes sense unfortunately if you have a router validating Prefixes, this router is not going to receive or to route this dot 95% of prefixes. And that's what happens. And this is more or less the same. This is a, a historical data. If you see, you, you get to believe that RPKI is not happening out there, it is fully happening. You will see the green line which corresponds to valid prefix. They are going up and up and up. And not found is going down, down, down. So the people in conclusion implementing RPKI on their network and prefixes. And this is all what I have, uh, Claire, in case uh, there are any questions out there. I, 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 love, I would love to hear any questions, comments, doubts, complaints. Hello, hello. Alejandro, I hope you, did you hear me? I said we don't have time for questions, but I will share your uh, email address with the participants so that they can reach out to you. Thank you so much for this presentation. We now turn, and we'll see you at Caribnog 26. We now turn over to Albert Daniels, who's going to give us a short update, some reminders of some of the things that he had told us this week, as his ICANN update. Thanks, Claire. And uh, the gentleman that you heard from earlier this morning, Nicolas Ant Antoniello, he works with ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. And at ICANN, we collaborate with several partners to ensure 
that we have a stable and open and interoperable and secure internet. I just wanted to mention that at ICANN we have three global meetings per year and the next, the next meeting is actually coming up in Hamburg, Germany and the dates of that meeting are the 21st to the 26th of October. Our last meeting was in June and we were actually in Washington DC. Interestingly, in March of 2024, from the 2nd to the 7th, we'll be having the meeting in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And I wanted to mention that because there is a program that we have at ICANN called the Next Gen Program. It's for students. And what we do in that program is whenever an ICANN meeting is close to or in our region, you can apply and we actually will pay for the airfare and the accommodation for students to attend that meeting. We have another program which is called the Fellowship Program and that one is not only for students, it is for anybody interested in attending an ICANN meeting. So for this meeting coming up in October, from the 21st of October, there are literally seven days left before the application process closes for uh, for Puerto Rico, I'm, I'm sorry, for ICANN 78 in Puerto Rico. So if you're interested in attending uh, the ICANN meeting in Puerto Rico and you're not able to pay for your own airfare and your own accommodation, if you go to the ICANN website, and you can write this down, ICANN.org, and just search for fellowships, and this is for everybody in the room, regardless of what badge you are wearing, what kind of uniform you have on, whether it's a police officer, customs officer, whether you're from a bank, anyone can apply to attend an ICANN meeting. So I just wanted to leave you with that and let you know that you still have seven days to apply for an ICANN fellowship to attend an ICANN meeting. Thank you so much for that, Albert. And please apply for some of you who may not know. I have had three fellowships at ICANN so far and have been to some amazing countries and it is worthwhile to apply. We now, remember I said to you, we, do, we have partnership with different organizations. We would have heard from ISOC, we heard from LATNIC, we heard from ICANN. Now we are going to hear from Bevel again wearing his RN hat as the um, Director of Caribbean Affairs. He's going to give us some RN updates. Thank you, Claire, and hello again, everyone. Uh, this will be quick. Let me get the, the clicker. Now, how many of you realize that there are some things being shared in these I.O.R.G. updates that, psh, let's go over your head. R.P.K.I. <laughs> D.N.F.S.E.C. But these are the kinds of topics. This is the equivalent of me describing the meeting I went to in, um, in the States where we were hearing about router leaks. Yeah, the mic is on. Where we're hearing about router leaks. These are things that are happening that there are people doing a lot of hard work to make sure that the region is on point with regard to its preparedness in some of these DNS security areas and internet infrastructure support areas. But for most of us, phew, never heard about it, didn't know it exists, couldn't care, um, and no really easy way to find out what it really means for us on a day-to-day -day basis. How I many could admit to some of the, the points of the last presentations kind of going like that for you. It's not a problem. Part of why we have to do these IORG updates is to allow us to understand the nature of the gap that has to be closed. Right? So seeing or hearing some of these statistics and numbers and programs and organizations is a big part of understanding how far we have to stretch or grow or develop to get to the point where we can say we are actually in this space in a contributing way as opposed to a hold the fort or sustain the, the line way. Because the region has to be out front as it relates to some of these areas of network security because our services depend on it. Uh, one of the things that we're not going to talk about this today but we'll talk about in the main meeting coming up in St. Kitts is just how much under attack the Caribbean is from cyber miscreants. You know, people who have jobs, and I mean literal jobs, to undermine, to infiltrate, and to disrupt your digital services and systems. Like jobs, I'm talking, you could come in as an entry-level person, and you could rise the ranks to coordinate teams. These are literal organizations behind some of these 
um, hack attacks that are affecting the Caribbean at every level. And for us to defend ourselves, we have to get okura or familiar with these kinds of conversations. So it might seem boring at first or over the head at first, but if you master some of these areas, you are at the front line of the jobs of the future. And that's why it's important, right? You could yawn through today, but some part of your brain should be saying, I need to understand what this is really uh, about because I'm not going to hear it in school. And I can tell you, you're not going to hear it in school, right? But you need to know it if you want to manage the networks of the future. So these IORG updates are that for us. I want to bring you a quick um, Aaron update. And I'm not going to go into some of those areas because you already had enough to shock you into we need to know a lot of stuff about a lot of stuff. But I want to talk about just where, where Aaron is. Aaron is the American Registry for Internet Numbers, the counterpart to LACNIC. You just heard from LACNIC. Uh, so one part of the RIR, or Regional Internet Registry System, deals with the Spanish-speaking um, and a few English-speaking Caribbean territories. Aaron deals with most of the rest of the English-speaking territories. So St. Vincent and the Grenadines is part of the Aaron service region, right? Any internet numbers, that's IP addresses or autonomous system numbers that are assigned in this territory come from Aaron. So it's useful for us to know what Aaron is about because Aaron is us. Uh, the priorities for 2023 continue to push the adoption of IPv6 again. A thing to note, IPv6 is not coming, it's here, and we need to be on top of it. It changes how we design networks, it changes how we roll out network services. And it's the, the new hot thing on the internet. Uh, providing registry services, prioritizing internet routing security, the same RPKI discussion that you got at LACNIC, you get at Aaron, and protecting the multi-stakeholder approach, which is what we're about here. So. What have we been working on? Surprise, surprise, all these <laughs> yawn topics. IPv6, RPKI, DNSSEC, um, ensuring that the deployment of services happens. Somebody has to do it. And so we are just part of that somebody. And we are saying for those who like to step into these behind the curtain type areas, if you're also interested in these under the curtain, under the hood type things, then you can be part of the community that is doing it. Where have we been? This is um, not so what I sent you. I sent you the wrong thing. I want to get to this. Yes, save the date. So part of what Aaron has been doing is having a much more direct outreach to the Caribbean. If you think about it, and here's, a, here's part of where the discussion is. We think about LACNIC and you think Latin America and the Caribbean. But when you think Latin America and the Caribbean, you really think Latin America. Right? Brazil, Argentina, Colombia. Same thing with the American Registry for Internet Numbers. We think America, maybe Canada. But the truth is there are more Caribbean territories in the Aran region than there are North American countries. It just so happens that the North American companies are significantly larger. But the fact is we have more country representation inside of Aran. And so Aran has been making a very concerted effort to ensure that there's greater Caribbean participation in Aaron activities from the policy making, which is where we get to say how the next generation of internet and number resource policy gets distributed and managed to participating in programs like the fellowship program and the grant program and the research program. Those things are now looking to hear Caribbean ideas about how can funds be used to develop Caribbean networks. So a big part of participating in these meetings, whether it's not going to San Diego or going to Minneapolis or, or Los Angeles, it's going to a community where we have an opportunity to actually shape how the Caribbean internet develops further. And going into an environment where they're looking for ideas about what kinds of projects are best suited to our region. So participation literally changes the trajectory, the shape, the conversation within the organization. And as an organization, Aaron is saying, we want more Caribbean voices. So at this upcoming meeting, there are elections, and they've been asking, are there persons within the Caribbean who are willing to participate on the Aaron board or willing to serve in the Aaron advisory group? Because there is a growing recognition that together, North America and the Caribbean represent the Aaron community. 
So I wanted to just bring that, that notice to you. You're hearing these topics, some of it might go over our heads, but all of it relates to the future, the stability and the resilience of the services and the networks that we are increasingly reliant upon for life. So somebody has to be mindful and caring about RPKI. Somebody has to think about DNSSEC, and that somebody might as well be us. All right, so Aaron, Lachnick, ISOC, they'll all have the same message. Come, participate, make your voice be heard. All right, so that's our IORG update. And for the things that you didn't understand, take note and go and check it out, research it, and continue to participate. All of these organizations have free meetings, free training, and free opportunities to participate. So let's take full advantage, okay? Yep, all right. Thank you so much, Bevel, for giving us a summary of the IOG and the importance of the IOG updates. Um, I just want to make a plug for applying for the different fellowships and even grants. For some of you with small businesses or with good um, innovation, innovative ideas, the grants are an opportunity for the grants are an opportunity for you to get some funding to do the things that we need to do in the Caribbean. And remember, I kept saying, and Bevel mentioned it as well, we need to be thinking about local solutions for global problems. And some of these grants provide that opportunity. Another thing is that um, the, we need to be in the room for the Caribbean to have a voice. And so attending some of these fora will help us to be in the room and will help the Caribbean to become even more, um, uh, in, to, to be heard. And so we need, you know, the Caribbean, we have a, a way of, we, some of us grew up hearing, um, be seen and not heard. That's not the way of the future. We have to be seen and we have to be heard and we need to start doing it now. This next pre presenter is, uh, where's Chris Lynn? Oh, Chris Lynn, yes. Chris Lynn, I don't want to butcher Chris Lynn's name. Chris Lynn Goborn Harry. Chris Lynn is here specifically to talk to, she'll talk to the rest of you, but mostly to the young people. Chris Lynn is an engineer, and she has built um, mobile apps and websites and she's going to talk to you about software as a service. So give Chris Lynn a round of applause, please. Thank you. Um, good morning. Good morning. Ah, good job. All right, so I'm going to talk to you today about um, software as a service, as you can see, SaaS. All right, and uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, SaaS for the Caribbean's digital future, and you are the future. So before we actually start the presentation, I want to ask, well, you a question. And the question is, imagine you are in charge of designing your ideal software application. What problem would it solve and how would it make your life easier? So if you're, if you're designing a software for you, for yourself, What problem would it solve? And how would it make your life easier? Anybody want to try? Okay, so think of all the software that you, all the apps that you have on your phone. Think of all the software that you use on a daily basis. Think of school. Think of home. Think of your social life. Think of going home and sitting on and watching Netflix. YouTube, WhatsApp, Facebook, and any other social media 
platforms that you're using. Is there anything that you think is missing that would make your life easier? Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Well, I think afternoon. Morning, morning still? Yeah, it is. OK. My name is Jonathan Wood. I'm from NTSC. So I mean, my answer is not technically software alone. It's software and kind of hardware. But um, the I'm going to try to explain it. So I'm not sure if it's already out there, but glasses to be able to move certain technology. So um, for example, this projector. Let's say I'm watching TV, right? And I want to change, change it. But I don't have the remote on me, right? Being able, with the move of my hand, to come out or change whatever I'm trying to watch, that would make my life easier. Um, for school, um, yeah. I have a book. Well, I'm reading them through my textbook, right? And it's kind of hard for me to understand. I could take it from the book, digitalize it, and have a computer basically summarize it or simplify it for me to understand. And it'll be right in front of my face without having to actually go through all of this. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so very much. All right, so we'll keep that thought in mind, and then we'll run through this presentation, and then I'm going to ask you another question at the end. All right? So let us... So our objective today is to explore the role that SAS plays in shaping the digital future of the Caribbean. And then we're going to talk about four key points that is uh, digital transformation in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the importance of SAS in the modern business landscape, the potential benefits of SAS in the Caribbean and the opportunities for developers. What is SAS? It is not new, but there's a lot of talk about it right now. Because a lot of persons are now, a lot of businesses, pers in your personal life, government agencies are moving now towards this thing that is not new, but it's getting a lot of new attention called SAS. And SAS is basically a cloud computing model where your software applications are stored and delivered via the internet. So instead of downloading something on your computer or your laptop, you access it through a web browser. You understand? OK. Now, when we talk about SAS, one of the important things about SAS that differentiates it from a traditional software is that you will not need to install it. You do not need to download the software. You do not need to install it on a hardware, right? So that eliminates the need for that physical infrastructure as a, as a startup company, as a young coder, or as a business. The software is hosted and maintained by a third-party provider and users. This is very important. Users normally pay a subscription fee. So that's one of the ways you can capitalize on SAS. Some key characteristics of SAS. One, it is subscription based. It means that the software that you are using via the browser Normally, you would pay a monthly or an annual subscription fee to use it. It uses a centralized hosting 
That means that it is hosted somewhere in the cloud. All your codes are there. The data is there somewhere in the cloud, and then everybody can access it from there, from that one point. We talk about automatic updates. It means if you think about the traditional software, for example, if I don't know about the younger generation, but maybe over this side, if we think about, um, say, when we, we had um, a software such as Microsoft Office, and then there's a new version out, what you'd have to do, well, maybe I'm talking to you as well, and there's a new version out, what you would normally have to do is download that version. Maybe you'd buy it, download it, install it on your computer, and then you can use it. But at this, while you're doing that, you also have to think about the compatibility of the software with your hardware. So can your hardware run this new version of the software that you're downloading? So that's one problem with the traditional software. But when it comes to SaaS, the updates are automatic because you're accessing it through your browser whenever the coders or the developers, whenever they make any changes on the software, it is automatically rolled out to everyone. Following me? Okay. There's also something called the multi tenancy tenacity sorry the multi tenacity of sas what this means is that you can simply create one code one piece of software and everybody can access it so that eliminates the need for versions so different versions version 1 version 1.2 and then different persons would be running different versions of your software. You serve multiple customers on the one shared infrastructure. Right? And then the data that is collected on SaaS, if you're using different customers, what you'll do is normally that data per client or per customer, per user, is stored on a different database or in a different um, secured and isolated location, right? Now then, there's also the ability to scale the software based on the user needs. So what do I mean by scaling your software? It means that if you develop a code or if you develop a software and you have a different sections, different pockets of the software that businesses can capitalize on. You can open a portion based on what the business needs. Or you as a user, if you only require a certain section of the software, but you don't need everything, you pay for what you want. So you can scale it up, you can increase your services, or you can also scale it down, depending on your needs. And then there is the accessibility. Five minutes. OK, so wrapping this up, <laughs> um, accessibility means that you can access the software from anywhere in the world, basically. and. Uh, it's also, you're also able to access your software using different devices, such as your tablet versus your phone versus your, your laptop, etc. Now, quickly running through the examples of SaaS, we have uh, software as a service, Microsoft 365, which, you're familiar, which you should be familiar with, that includes Teams that we were using um, regularly. There's also Google Suite, Netflix, Moodle, Zoom, etc. And we, I'm just going to skip this section here, skip over this section quickly. The SaaS versus SAP. Now, SaaS is software as a service, so we can imagine that SAP is software as a product. And the software as a product is what we would refer to as a traditional way of delivering software versus the, the way that we're moving towards now, right? 
And um, so let's just skip some, some um, slides. All right, so I'm going to skip some slides. I'm going to talk about um, how SAS is transforming St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And where there's a lot of talk about the Digital Transformation Project. There is also something that you'll be using very soon, which is the online application system to access the community college. And uh, um, of recently, there's a lot of integration into the classrooms of SAS applications where, for example, Zoom, right? Um, now opportunities for providers. So this is where we come in as developers. So what are our opportunities to SAS? We can capitalize on the local market, creating local solutions for the Caribbean region, right? There is also promoting digital inclusion and also the possibility of partnership. Partnership meaning we, we talk about collaboration with business entities and also the government. Um, now, this section here is important. I'm going to condense it as quickly as I can. When we talk about, um, when we're developing our SaaS applications, we have to ensure that our applications are universal acceptance ready. What does this mean? I think Nicholas would have touched on a little bit of that. Universal acceptance simply means that when you develop your application, you need to ensure that when you put it out there, persons that don't use English language, persons that don't use the alphabet and numbers, for example, in Taiwan or in um, Israel, they can also use your application. So you need to basically ensure that your application is capable of covering a wide and diverse audience. And that is how you expand your business. Um, so I'm going to skip through some stuff there. Now, one of the things that I want to touch on quickly as well, OK, is um, the developers forum that you can capitalize on as young developers. This is where you can come and learn or uh, ask your questions about SAS, universal acceptance, or anything like that related to coding if you're interested in, in that sort of stuff. And uh, unfortunately, I'm sorry, we cannot go back to that question. I am all out of time, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Chris. Chris Lynn. <laughs> Had a senior moment there. <laughs> um, we would love to take questions, but you see, you understand now why Caribnog is normally a two day event and not just a half day event. There is so much information that we have for you, and we're just trying to, to bottle it and, and provide you with a little snippet. We now move on. We have an online presentation for you to understand a little bit about Routing 101. And that's a video that's going to come up in a short while. I'm not sure if we will have um, time for questions after this. But we, but you know, keep bear, your, bear in mind your questions. We do have a mailing list. And we, the, I'm sure that the presentations are going to be posted and the information from the presenters will also be available so that you can liaise with all of us. And this presentation should be coming up. Now it's from Mr. Steve Spence, who is also a co-founding member of Caribnog. He is Jamaican and he lives in Trinidad and Tobago and works for an organization by the name of Architects. Yes. Just as we had Nico here in person, who is a, a strong engineer and can talk to us about DNSSEC, we have our very own Steve Spence, who is one of the premier engineers in the Caribbean and has actually worked on projects in Russia 
um, engineering projects. So we do have our own um, experts in the Caribbean. So we're ready to hear Steve now. Thank you. Let's give Steve a round of applause, even though Hello. he isn't in the Good room. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Spence, a regular carb nugger. And I'm going to do a overview and basic internet routing. OK. OK. Um, the internet. Um, Essentially, if this first picture, I want to, everybody to get a view of the, the interconnectedness of the in infrastructure that represents the internet. Um, there are millions of miles of um, cables, fiber optic cabling, um, connecting every major city, every major area across the globe, ensuring that there is point-to-point -point connectivity between every point um, on the planet. The only continent doesn't have a lot of fiber attached to it is um Antarctica and you know they might have actually a microwave or satellite connectivity in that case. Okay, all right, so let's describe what is the internet. Internet is the internet of things. It is uh, essentially any infrastructure or any component that allow all the different computer networks managed by separate organizations to communicate and exchange information. Essentially allows a um, seamless and reliable, secure and um, communication near the speed of light across our planet. And this is done transparently. You don't need to understand how the internet work to use it. Essentially everything under the covers is easily and effectively working um, transparently. Um, typical things exchange on the internet, um, telephone calls, um, email messages, video conferencing calls, um, radio and television, music and music. These are just a few of the things that are actually, um, a small minute component of the media actually exchange on the internet. But essentially, the internet can essentially transfer and exchange many things, almost anything, once it can be digitize. Okay, all right, let's get familiar with some of the core technologies, which you've probably heard of before. TCP IP, uh, Transmission Control Protocol, and Internet Protocol. Essentially, it's just a suite, a suite of um, programs that are responsible for, number one, assigning the unique IDs for each devices that are on the internet and essentially uh, manage the connectivity between um, different nodes on the internet. DNS um, essentially is a database that essentially map the human friendly names and the IP address that are used onto the internet because you know we humans like readable things and numbers are just not very um, easy to remember. So you will see that in the name of like Google, mail servers, all of them use the actual DNS um, services in order to map the IP addresses to user-friendly names. HTTP. HTTP essentially is a document um, transfer protocol, or called hypertext transfer protocol. Essentially allows to um, exchange documents. That was the original concept behind HTTP. But today we use it for almost everything. Um, these documents can in can have videos, can have applications, the the amount of different type of um, documents that can be exchanged, uh, media that can be exchanged, it is almost infinite. So um, HTTP is an extensive protocol for the exchange of basically multimedia content. Um, SNMP, the original killer app for the internet, allowed for the seamless transport of messages across the globe. It was one of the first major use of the internet. And BGP um, is a protocol that essentially allowed 
the different independent networks that are interconnected on the internet to exchange um, information concerning states, uh, routes, or uh, paths, okay, on the internet. Okay, um, let's, let's look at the different format for the outdressing ID um, that's uh, linked to IP traffic. Essentially, every device have a unique ID. Um, it comes in two flavors, basically, uh, two versions, V4 and V6. V4 um, supports the 32-bit addressing system. So essentially, um, it can support up to, theoretically, it support up to 2 to the 32-bit number of devices. In reality, it's much less, because there's some part of this um, scheme that can't be used for direct device attachment. However, you know, as it says, it's, it's almost a four billion, over four billion devices, far less than the number of devices that the internet actually um, has. So obviously, um, they, they, they have some constraints. Um, one of the solutions to this constraint that V4 have was V6, a 128-bit um, recent system, supports uh, a number that I cannot pronounce, but um, 3.4 3 to the um, 32 zeros, 38, 39 zeros. Um, it's supposed to be more than the atom in the universe. So, um, yeah, some yeah, the obvious advantage, you can support a lot more devices. Number two, um, in terms of routing, is actually a little bit more efficient than, than IPv4. And so, therefore, from a routing and a device addressing point of view, it's it has it can be can scale up to meet that requirement. Okay, let's get a look at it. Generally, IPv4 is generally represented in a, a decimal notation, a dot decimal notation. Um essentially it's um again it's really for human beings who are more prone to like decimal. Um underneath, the, underneath it is really converted to binary which it itself allows the machine to actually use this, this protocol. But essentially, we memorize the decimal numbers, OK? But the computers are the routers that use this number, obviously convert it into binary. Um, it's 32 bits um, divided into bytes, um, into bytes. And the positions they have actually have some significance, which we will explore later. Um, IPv4, um, use hexadecimal or the 16 um, notation um, to help us manage the length and the size of this number. Um, again, don't let the numbers um, get you confused. It's essentially like, um, like IPv4. We manage it like IPv4. Um, and everything that we say that is true for IPv4 is definitely true for IPv6. A typical um, LAN configuration, um, servers, client machines hooked up to a IP uh, to a router, a ISP router, which then connects to the overall internet. As soon as you hook up to the internet, you are part of the internet. So, so, so once you're full or you connect to a wireless provider, you're essentially become part of the general internet, albeit a single node, but you are become part of this large network, and so you are part of the internet. So, as reference, um, this is just for reference to give an idea of how routing works. We use a, a typical four router configuration just for ease of use, so we can understand understand how routing work and how routers are configured. A uh, couple of machines, four routers, and we are going to just explore how you know. Um, routing works in this configuration. Uh, typically, um, if, uh, if a device want to require the use of IP stack, essentially, um, for example, if you're going to a, a website, IP um, essentially assign um, the source IP address of the device, the destination the address of the device, a header. Also, it breaks up the data requests as well, if necessary. and apply a header to it. Um, this is basically the full number of headers in a typical um, 
um, IP packet, just for reference. Um, essentially, each device are configured with this uh, IP address, a subnet mask, and a default gateway. These are the components that define a, a fully routable IP device. Um, you will find that in an IP address, um, there's a network ID and there's a client ID. It's kind of segmented that way. So we want to um, um, connect to a remote site. Essentially, um, the protocol adds a source IP address, a source destination IP address, and then send the packet to a default gateway. The default gateway essentially is a router, or interface on a router, that then now the router is now responsible for actually finding where the destination is or sending the packet to a, a ro another router that may have a better idea of where the, um, the, the, the device is, okay? Just again, telling the breakdown of the, the packets. And this is where we understand how some determine the, the difference between the network ID and the client ID. As you realize, the 255, when translated to binary, is ones. Where there are ones that define the actual network ID portion of the, of the packet. And where there's zeros, that section is a client ID section of the, of the, of the addressing system. OK? So what is routing? Routing is a process of making a decision, uh, making a decision as to the best path and the best way to find a device on the internet. That's essentially what routing is. Usually this process involves looking up a table, like an Excel spreadsheet, essentially. A table that actually have a mapping of network ID, uh, interface through which it was learned, and the ad address of the nearest hop, the uh, nearest interface of a router that knows where the device is or knows where to get to another device that knows where it is, okay? And this internal representation is called the routing table. That's it, that's not natural. Using this table, the router is able to make decisions based on the content and the different values in the routing table. A router, a router can be a general purpose device like a, a set of computer or dedicated appliance. In most cases on the internet, there are dedicated appliances. So uh, most, almost all operating system, modern operating system can be configured to be a router. And so, uh, so you can, you'll find routers that are based on Linux that are very sophisticated and has all, all, full, all the full features on appliance as well. As well, if you have very limited routing needs, a Windows server can actually serve as a router. Requirements. Um, each router in our interconnect needs to have an of the information needed to make the decisions. Each router are, are independent entities. They don't, they don't really need other the function, they don't really need other routers to function. They just need other routers to tell them the right information. That's all they need. Once they have the right information, they make a decision based on the information they currently have. Um, so the first step they're doing is to get the most updated information about the topology of the network. And then, and that's, this is now used to actually create or generate a routing table. Um, the sequence is normally very straightforward. Um, of course, the interfaces that are directly or physically connected to the router are immediately used to populate the, the first section of the, of the routing tables. Also, statically created um, entries are entered normally by the administrators. And then additional routes learned from other routers, which are advertising their routes through um, dynamic routing protocols. Okay. Okay, so this is an example of, of, a, of a routing table. You see one field as the interface to which the, 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 um, the, the network is connected to or it was learned from. The subnet mask to help to determine what section of the IP address is the network ID and what section is the client ID. And the next router 
that can possibly deliver the packet to its final destination. Okay, so if we quickly look at our, our reference diagram here, just for a little bit. You see, in R1, R1 routing table will has this this network address. So of course it has um this as its first entry. And the E1 side, there's another IP address. Okay, and its next hot neighbor, which is in R2, has the IP address um 204.79.179.201. So let's look back at this. You will notice that um this is the um the the address, the address of the network ID that's connected directly to it. So that's making an entry. And that's the IP address of the actual um, network. E2, um, these are actually network addresses, uh, ID that can be discovered or found on the R2 router. So therefore, this router will send Anytime it receives a destination IP with these um, network IDs, it will send it to the R2 um, router. Okay. Um, R1, R2. Um, yeah, it should actually be one here, but uh, error there. And up, upstream. You will also, okay, so let's look at R2. Because R2 is infinitely more um, interesting in terms of routing table. Because this router just sends everything to this router. And this router has two connections, one that goes to the DBC website, per se, and one goes to Netflix website. So to, to get access to these websites, to these um, resources, um, the, the clients on this office network need to go through R2. So R2 actually has a very good connectivity to multiple websites. So this routing table sends most of the connectivity to this R2 website. So therefore, observe. So just observing that, that you can notice that R2, yes, R2 has multiple entries that describe the different network. Um, this is the office, this is the BBC, this is a um, Netflix, and it sends it to the next hop route available to get to those things. Okay, you know, this has a entry right here, which, is, which has 000, 000, 000. 000, 000 traditionally means um, wildcard. If nothing of the destination IP address is found in the previous um, entries, this is a kind of catch-all that catches this packet and sends it to the next hub that may actually have a more complete routing table. Okay, so it's called a default route for that case. And so it's R3, R4, and you know, these showing the different parts that a packet might take in order to get to this. Um, because you know, it can go through here. That sort of thing. Okay. Okay, so obviously there are millions of routers all across the internet, thousands of service providers. Every core router must have a complete picture of the network, which means they must have a complete routing tables. Uh, routing tables are, are now very large, 600,000 records. And network IDs, routes are added and changed frequently. And manually updating the table would be, you know, help. So here or here in the game is BGP. BGP allow for the exchange of routing information. Um, BGP is a standard through the internet called by multiple manufacturers that allow internet routers to essentially exchange um, routing information with each other very quickly um, over TCP IP. So the routers are usually grouped together uh, in one administrative group called an administ if you if this no, bunch of routers are, are, are managed by one organization, they usually group together in an autonomous system and assign autonomous number, number which is called uh, ASN. This number has to be unique, just like um, IP addresses. It has to be unique so and essentially managed through the, uh, um, through the internet. 
Um, to give you an idea of how BGP make decisions, again, our routing routers have to be able to make good decisions and they base them on certain and a very good, flexible routing protocol allows you to use multiple attributes, as they're calling BGP, to make decisions. They could be weighted, um, <laughs> weighted, weighted influence, the route and telling you this is the best route. There could be local input. These are things that the, the administrator of the router can do and set. There is a path that we call the autonomous system path. Okay, we, we look at that one. The the origin of those routes can be used as a um, as a way to influence what path to be chosen to, to a particular point. And MED can also specify that this is the best route to get to a particular point. So looking at the as part, um, you know, this shows the path of a packet going through the network. If you notice, um, um, each router has a ASN. Um, in this case, what is tracked by the BGP routing protocol is the eight, the number of ASN that the the route advertisement had to pass through as the packet traverse. The routers, the ASN number is added to the actual advertisement part. So the, the, the BGP router will make a decision based on how long the path is. Okay, so as you see in this case, the path is AS800, AS100, AS500. AS1 is a much shorter path because the routers are actually grouped together in, in uh, fewer um, ASN numbers. Um, AS800 is um, is 800 and is 1000. In that scenario, um, the the num um, the the part this would be the shortest path based on the ASN numbers. Okay, summarizing, internet um facilitate many services. It does it very efficiently, very reliable because of TCP/IP and BGP. Um, the reliability is a product of the orchestration of many different technologies. Routing being one of the core critical functions that must work properly um, and independently so that different um, paths and network can be coordinated with each other in order to work very well together. Okay, so this is routing one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much. And have a good
itself <laughs> plan to give. We didn't plan to be long, so that's good. That's a good start. So our CCTV system here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is one of our IT flagships for government, right? Um, it's basically the installation of approximately 200 CCTV cameras on mainland St. Vincent. We haven't touched the Grenadines as yet. And these cameras are located in the Kingston, Windward. Come on up, Simone, and rescue me. <laughs> right, so the cameras are located in the Kingston area, Leeward and Windward areas, and as I said, on mainland. Phase two will take care of the Grenadines and other areas of mainland, so you can take it away from there, Simone. Okay, but I'm not sure what you already said. Just mentioned that it's uh, one of the government's IT flagships and where the cameras are located. That's where I got to. Okay, so this project, the first phase was a two-year project, started from 2019 to 2021. And it was a col collaboration between the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the government of the Republic of China on She's Taiwan. catching her breath. I'm catching my breath. Sorry, I ran up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, um, so the project has been imp was implemented by um, the Ministry of Finance, Economic Planning, and Information Technology in collaboration, of course, with the Ministry of National Security, specifically the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force. So, and the Information Technology Services Division from the Ministry. So, um, currently we are in, let's say, maintenance mode yeah. for the project. As Mrs. Armstrong said, we have um, about 186 cameras installed across mainland St. Vincent. And the next phase of the project, which is phase two, will be coming on stream very soon later down in the year, where we would be expanding, um, putting more cameras into different locations on the mainland, but we'll be expanding the project to some of the Grenadine Islands. So we would not just have coverage on the mainland, but also coverage in the Grenadine Island. This is a project that has proven to be very successful so far, because we have had reports from the police force that they are able to solve some of the crimes that has been committed just because of the footage from the cameras. So we are really pleased and we are really happy about this project. And we know that by the time phase two comes on, we will have more um, surveillance in more places, which gives us even more opportunities to solve crimes. So I think um, this is something that is very important for us, and I hope that um, our citizens pay attention that, you know, we have to look out for each other. But at the same time, if there are cases when we can't, we would try to rely on the cameras we have in those locations to help us to fight crimes. All right, and to end, because I see Dr. Craig is on her feet. <laughs> um, all of these cameras, at the background of all of these cameras is what we call a control center, and that is manned by the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force, as Simone mentioned, and we have 24-7 monitoring. Wrong the clock. So anytime a crime is committed, you will be caught, all right? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Simone and Desri. Very well done. So now you have an idea of what is going on uh, in, with the CCTV project. Another thing that I will just take five minutes, we have three minutes to thank you all for being here. But before we do that, I just want to give the opportunity. We need to have an open mic. We need to get a couple of comments on how, to, how your three days were, how your uh, today was, j in a word, just, uh, Albert says he wants to have the first comment, and let me just see two, two hands up, and uh, yes, can you give the mic to the gentleman in the back? 
Thank you, Claire. Uh, it, it was really fantastic coming to St. Vincent. And I think we've met our, objecti our objectives based on the participation that we've seen and the interaction that we've had with all of you. And most importantly, the relationships that we have uh, developed and made during this visit. So when we continue talking afterwards, we have eyeballed the persons that we are speaking to. You know, we've had a, a, a glass of juice with them and we are able to, to develop further. For Simone and the presentation we just had, there's an opportunity for collaboration. I just came from a Canto meeting in, in Miami and CCTV was, was one of the areas where they looked at the application of artificial intelligence. So in that control center, uh, the persons could actually type in, um, show us all of the people who were walking in red dresses or show us everybody who was uh, riding a bicycle. And very interestingly, there was a programming of an illegal turn, and they could query the, uh, an illegal turn on the roads, and they could query the system and say, tell us how many vehicles made that illegal turn, and all of the registration and, and licensing data would come up, and then you could actually issue travel tickets based on the footage of what's going on. So there's an opportunity for collaboration, particularly using artificial intelligence. But fantastic three days, and I look forward to coming back to St. Vincent again, mm -hmm. uh, where we can do this one more time. Thank you, Albert. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, Karibnog is, is quite pleased to have had the opportunity to be here for the three days and to participate. And we would like to thank all the persons who participated today. We thank our sponsors for this event. I know we have another comment over there. And, you know, this is, we, we just want to close Karibnog have the one comment, and then I'm going to ask Ruggs and John to come and give the closing remarks and vote of thanks. So, <laughs> Carib Nog is now officially closed. <laughs> but can I have the question from the... Yeah. the did you have a, a question or a comment? Well, yeah, the, you need the mic? No, we are, we are online. Lancelot Chapman of Echo Incorporated Music Rights. Uh, when I first came in, I said uh, they were talking about the um, uh, development of this system with the government, and I said, well, would it have been nice to have other, other areas of the community at the start of, the, of, the, uh, of, of this program so that they, everybody would be on at least on a kind of a page at some point in the progress. And lo and behold, the children came in. And I feel good about that. So I can say one thing about this. I've learned a lot. And I want to thank uh, Carib Nog and ICANN and all of the uh, participants for my education. And I will certainly share it with the board of directors of ECHO. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you have made my task very easy. You started the ball rolling. So you have said, said it all, you enjoy being here for the, the last three days. Well, I see you show. Um, so we heard from you. Anybody else wish to share and express thanks or say how they, they enjoy the three days that they were here? Anybody brave enough? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I've only been here for the last two days, but it's, some of it has uh, have been an eye-opener to me. Uh, it was a little more than I expected, but I think I've learned something. And I, I'm going to be better for it. I'm going to be contacting my closer sources um, who are in the IT business, and so I learned some new, uh, should I call them words or synonyms? <laughs> All those jargon that we've been hearing about, so I'm going to speak like I know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been, it's been a pleasure being here. Thank you. Anyone else before Rudy? Okay, let me put it like this. 
I need one more person before Rudy. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Hello, I'm Eastlin, Eastlin Bayam. I think it was very, very informative. And I think um, you spoke um, on almost every little topic that they will do in the technological world. And I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed. And I am really satisfied that I came. I did make the sacrifice to come here for the three days, and I'm very, very happy about it. Thank you very much. Rudy, it's your time. Rudy, it's your turn. So I was so impressed by all the comments, you know, and that's where it's at. It's not about me, it's not about the speakers who came, it's about the people in the room who have something to say that makes sense to them after they've watched all that complicated stuff, you know. And so I, I, I would want to congratulate the St. Vincent and Grenadines, ISOC, the Internet Society, and I hope we get a few more members from this, because that's what we want. And we also want members from all areas of the community, be you in health, be you in banking, be you in whatever it is, um, ICT is part of you. But one of the things I always say at every single roadshow I've been to, in one shape or the other, is that I hope the next one will have, should we say, an exhibition of regional providers, you know? And that would be nice because, you know, we'll get, we'll get more and more people to come in. So I'm not saying any more than that. Oh, but also I want to thank, I want to thank in particular uh, Albert for being here. <laughs> and I also want to, no, I, I'm saying that because we met in 2007 and we also, and we were also together, we met um, Beville as well and Rodrigo, who was here earlier. Um, we were all in the same group back in 2007. So everything takes time. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. We have a little token from ISOC for those who participate, except Rudy. We ain't giving Rudy nothing. We just thank him, and that's good enough for Rudy. But those who participated, give me a name again. Foster Burke. Mr. Foster Burke. Eastland Byam. Eastland Byam, and could you stand? We give a little token. We encourage you. The chapter is open. You can join our chapter as well. Uh, somebody has some tokens? Yeah, wonderful. You see when you're brave? Pitt, you see if you're brave? You get tokens from us? <laughs> you be reward for being brave in a man. <laughs> Thank you very much. So remember to join our chapter. Thank you. <laughs> Since we're talking about ads, may I also mention that uh, I operate a small guest house in Pembroke known as Burkasa Bed and Breakfast oh. and Spa. Please don't forget to look this up on the internet. All right. <laughs> Good. Do you know we have an I, um, girls in ICT program in St. Vincent and Grandins? Mentor mentorship that's going on for what, a year or so? No. It will be for a year? It will be for a year. Just so we now started? Yeah. We have um, mentees here? Yes, we do. Mentees, we have? Mentees So we have one? And the Oh. Davisha. Davisha and Kayla. Kayla. So we, owe, we, owe, we owe tokens. Eh? We'll get some tokens for you. Because I know you are here for, three, for the three, two, two days and the first day. Yeah, wonderful. So Simone will make sure you get the token from ISOC, OK? Uh, Yes, Mr. Burke? This is another book, right? Yeah, related. <laughs> Actually, that's my uncle. <laughs> yeah, but um, I wanna, just want to say, I'm exhausted. I was there yesterday because I had a, a kid's program yesterday. 
But it's all the talk that we hear, all the jargon that you don't understand. I think the aim is to really have the internet more secure. So when you hear about DNS security or DNSSEC, and you talk about IPv6, you're talking about using, a, using applications that make the internet spot safer. So the whole quest about everything is just to make sure that the internet is safe. So those who don't understand all the jargon, that's the purpose of it. So we want to make sure our ISPs implement DNS security in the, on the networks so that we could transact our, make our transactions more safer. We want to make sure they implement the IPv6 because IPv6 has some built-in security features in it and so that we could make our internet much safer. That's basically what we're all about. And I must say, Mr. Bork is managing NCTI, which is one of our partners in ISOC. I must say that. Good contribution. So I think the money will take it from here. Okay. No problem. So thank you again, everyone, for being here. It was a pleasure having you on board with us for the three days, those of you who started and finished. But we really want to give a special thank you to some, well, our presenters who are left here. We know two of them already um, left. So I'm going to start first with Claire, Dr. Claire Craig. And um, I just want to let you know how appreciative we are of the presentations you did for us about the whole Lac Rallo and all those things. But I think what impressed me more, well, for me, what impressed me about you is your journey, your story, how you started at the bottom, basically at ICANN, and how you have progressively, you know, advanced in your journey in this institution. So I really want to congratulate you. And I think you set a path for people like me who are still at the bottom. You're showing me the path where I must follow in order to advance. It's all about, I feel good about it because it's like woman's empowerment. So I look at it, this is a woman who has really excelled and I really want to model after you. So that's, that, that's for me personal. But on behalf of ISOC, thank you very much for your contributions to our program this week. Okay? And... We just have a token of appreciation for you. <laughs> the next person I want to thank is Bevel Wooding. <laughs> So, um, as Rudy mentioned about the whole history, about how long he knew Belleville and everything. But um, I just want to say something about Belleville for me. In case you did not know, now I'm telling, not a story, but I'm telling you this. Belleville is actually my mentor. So, I go to him for a lot of advice about technology and IT stuff. And in terms of my career journey, he advised me a lot on it. So, I really appreciate that. But today... I mean, seeing him just come and talk and adapting or changing, I should say, his presentation style a bit to suit the students who were here, bringing it down to their level. I think that was really, you know, good because, you know, sometimes this tech talk could fly up over here. There are big term, terms that you may not understand. And breaking it down to the students' level, I thought that was a really good thing he did today in his presentation. So, Beverly, thank you very much for always being willing to participate and to, you know, work with us with your many hats, whether it's Arab, Arin, Carib, Nog, others, we appreciate what you did for us here today. So we'd like to also give you a token of appreciation. Thank you. <laughs> so, and then we have my friend here, Albert Daniels. <laughs> when Albert asked us, uh, you know, to collaborate with this whole program, originally the idea was really to have a separate program for ICANN. But we figured, well, we're having ISOC, might as well we combine everything because we're going to deal with the same set of stakeholders, basically. And you know you have to try to maximize your time because everybody's working and so forth. So um, 
I think I was really pleased, but I was surprised a bit too because when he came in and he saw the hall being transformed from what, he's, what he would have seen a few weeks before he came for this um, session, I think he was really pleasantly surprised. But in my head, I was like, what did you expect? <laughs> <laughs> of course, we are going to do a good job. <laughs> But it's always good when your stakeholders could be pleased with the work that you did. So, um... Vincent. everyone again. Thank you again for participating in this week's program. Well, not this week, but it's three days. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Simone. I don't even know if I'm needed here. <coughs> okay, but let me just do the official. And as a chairperson of the events committee of SBG ISOC chapter, and on behalf of the chapter, I'd like to extend our sincere thanks to everyone who made this three days event the success it has been. I think I can say that for everyone. So thank you to our moderator, Dr. Craig Clare, for your excellent job in keeping the program on track throughout the morning. You had it on time. It's the others that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> to Mr. Beville Wooden for your ideas on local solution for a global problems delivered in such a simple way that the students understood and were able to relate to Nicholas Antonino for sharing his wealth of knowledge on DNSSCC. We were well informed. To Steve Spence for your insightful presentation on Carib Nog. To Chris Owen, Chris Lynn Goodborn, Harry for your session with the young people. It was good. And our, those are our body encoders, and we do thank you for that. And to all our hardworking members of the ISOC Events Committee and the ISOC Executive, we collaborated, we worked hard, and I think it paid off. I say thank you all. And to all attendees today, and we give you, we thank you. For, to Seanan <coughs> for his presentation and his update on ISOC, Alessandro, on LACNIC and Beville on Aaron. We say thanks for all the information. You know, we would not have been that updated had you not given your presentation. And finally, to our sponsors for the general support for this event, and this include ICON, IGF, Aaron, Karimnog, ITSD for their technical support, ITFX, their support and, and live streaming, Flow Business for the tea breaks, NTRC, who sponsored the venue, Digital Business for the live streaming, ECAPS, technical support, ISOC, SVG, technical, well, we were the secretariat, ITSD, I think I said that already, Pascal John for his photography, we thank you. And we thank you for your contributions and your commitment to making the internet a more accessible and equitable resource. We all appreciate all of your efforts. 
Thank you again for joining us, those who only joined us today, those who did the three days. We thank you, and most of all, we give God thanks for being with us and helping us too. Have a great day. Thank you. We always have to thank the person who do the vote of thanks. <laughs> and we just want to thank John Quill. Kodogan, as she rightly said, she's the leading the event committee. She has a team um, that, is, that is here. <laughs> we just want to thank them very much for really work together and really make this thing happen. Thank you, John, John Quill. And finally, we thank the participants who come, sacrifice the time. Sorry, um, you know, it's so short. But I hope you have learned, and we, we build a camaraderie. Um, you know, one of the purposes of this is to, to get to network, to know each other. If you, after three days, you don't know anybody, something is wrong, or something, somebody new. So you should learn and learn something, know somebody, you know. We have one more opportunity, lunchtime. If you didn't learn anybody new, learn about somebody new. And may God bless us as we continue to advance the internet um, development and promotion in St. Vincent and the Grannies and in the region. All the best and safe travel back and those who are going to enjoy St. Vincent and the Grenadines from today, please do it, enjoy, and tell us all about it on Facebook. <laughs> 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 all right. <laughs>